Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Gives in the Bank recruiting podcast brought to you by BuckeyeScoop.com. I am Mark Givler. I am joined by Bill Green today. As always, we are going to uh, kind of go over some Ohio stuff today, but this, if you're tuning in now, this is the uh, Wednesday, July 29th episode, so we are hopefully close to high school football. Um, I know some states are canceling right now and postponing, but um, as of the recording today, um, Ohio is still pushing forward, um, hoping to start uh, fall camps here in the coming days, as are some other neighboring states like Indiana. I just got a, a text about the uh, Indiana high school football situation, and it looks like they're pressing forward as well. So we're, we're going to be, um, we're hopeful here, we're going to have some football to talk about uh, on our podcast here in the coming weeks. But um, in the meantime, I thought this would be a good opportunity. Uh, Bill put out a story on the website on Wednesday morning. It detailed a list of Ohio rising seniors who um, could see their stocks go up here this fall if, if we uh, get a season and have some new film. And we're going to kind of take an Ohio State look at that list in terms of some guys with an outside chance at maybe earning an offer from Ohio State. Some of these guys are going to be longer shots than others, but um, we're just going to kind of analyze that and see who might have uh, the door maybe cracked open for certain guys and kind of analyze that. Um, I'm going to let Bill start. Uh, we're going to kind of go back and forth here, probably go, go one player at a time. We've each got a few guys we want to talk about. Uh, Bill, who do you want to talk about first? Yeah, first off, I want to mention is Mitchell Evans, the uh, tight end out of Wadsworth, because I just saw him a couple weeks ago and was really impressed. Um, he is 6'7", legit. I mean, he's all 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, no doubt about that. It's not a stretch. Um, he says he weighs 240 right now. He looks to be 250, 260 to me, and no fat on him at all. And to watch him go through tight end drills, you know, he, he really has that um, more Jake Ballard than Nick Vanette. Kind of used Nick Vanette in my article just to, you know, show that he's more of, you know, tall, long, wide dude, you know. So, it, but what I like about Mitchell is I, I really can see him playing offensive tackle with that wingspan. And he's going to play quarterback this year for his school. And there are very few offensive tackles that played quarterback. So that's how athletic he is. And when I look at him down the road as a 6'7", 290-pound kid with that wingspan and those feet, I mean, you'd have to put some time into him. And, you know, if you see him as, as an offensive tackle, then you're going to have to groom him. You're, it's not going to be a guy that you're going to expect to play early and then be disappointed when he doesn't. But um, I think Mitchell's really favoring Notre Dame right now, and, and I think it's a great choice for him. Notre Dame will play those big, huge tight ends that are blockers first, pass catchers second, and they throw it to him too. So he fits there. And then if he does outgrow the position and ends up being an O tackle for them, they're great at developing those offensive tackles for the NFL too. So I think Mitchell Evans in Notre Dame, I think, man, it's a really good fit for both parties. Um, Ohio State has been recruiting him as a tight end. I think they would like to add a second tight end. I don't think it's the end of the world if they don't. I don't think Mitchell would be high on that second tight end list. And for him to get in the Ohio State class, I mean, they would almost have to see him as a hybrid tight end O lineman. We got one spot left. Let's let's shoot it on this six seven athlete that could play, you know, tight end or O line for us. But I like Mitchell a lot, and I think he's got a chance to be really good at the next level. Yeah, I like the idea of Evans if um, if it gets later on and it's one of those situations where they've got still one tight end and, you know, maybe three offensive linemen, and it's like, well, is there room for a second tight end and a fourth offensive lineman? Probably not, so split the difference and take Mitchell Evans. I think that would make sense at that point. Um, and then you've at least filled one of those two. Um, potential needs. Um, I'll stick with uh, tight end here, though. Um, you know, Jack Pugh out of Hilliard Bradley, I think he has the most uh, to gain by a senior season in terms of strictly just looking at kind of Ohio State and in, within the state of Ohio right now. Um, clearly, they would like a second tight end. 
they don't seem to love any of the options right now, any of the realistic options at least. Um, and this is a kid who lost, you know, we've talked about this before. He, he didn't play football for a couple of years. He focused on basketball. He came back to the football field last year and got injured, um, injured his hand wrist. So he was playing in a cast. So he stopped playing tight end about midway through the season because he couldn't catch a football and they put him at defensive end where, you know, he was able to kind of play through it. And so he's, he's got, there's so little information on him at this point, but he's such a great athlete. I mean, he's legitimately six, five, six, six, he's 235 pounds. He can run like again, really good basketball player. So he's got a lot of that coordination you're looking for. And I think he's a guy that if he could put up a few good games at the beginning of the season, it doesn't, I don't think it's got to be a lot. I think this guy, he's just got to flash a little bit. And if he can do that, I, I would at that point put Jack Pugh right at the top of the list of potential Ohio offers for the Buckeyes. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. I, you, you know, you covered Mitchell Evans. So that I think that probably takes care of, of the tight end uh, situation, at least as far as Ohio guys are concerned. Um, I know there's another guy, you know, a couple other guys you want to talk about, Bill. I'll kind of let you kind of take it from there. You know, who else, who else do you think is worth uh, a look here this fall? Yeah, a guy that I really like, but I, I don't think is really going to excite Ohio State fans, would be Akron Hoban defensive end Daryl Peterson. And he is a heck of a player. But for Daryl to get in the Ohio State class, he's committed to Wisconsin now, loves Wisconsin. You know, would he listen to Ohio State? I think he would. Um, for him to get in the class, that would involve JT to a Maloa going somewhere else, maybe to Missy Adelaide decommitting. I mean, these are not, you know, to get Daryl Peterson in this class is probably not going to be good news for Ohio State. And right now, he would be absolutely a plan B kid. Um, only because they're in on so many superstars this year. If Daryl was a 2019 guy, I would have taken him over any D lineman they got last year. If Henry, uh, Cowan, and uh, Hamilton, I would have taken Daryl over all three of those guys. So I think he's Ohio State quality, but you know you're bumping up against Sawyer, Malone, and th- that group, Mike Hall. And the other guys are chasing, well, that puts him to plan B this year. So for Daryl to get in the class, it would involve a lot of bad things happening for Ohio State. But I love the kid as a leader, as a winner. This is not a measurable guy. This is just a, a productive guy that makes plays all over the field. You can't run at him. He stops you. You better double him in a passing situation because he's going to sack your quarterback. He's a captain. He's a leader, a winner. I mean, this is the, this is the Jim Trestle recruit from 10 years ago. This is a guy Trestle would never be able to pass up. So lots of like with Daryl from my end, but for the Ohio State fan, you know, when you see the offer go out to Daryl Peterson, it probably means bad things happen. Yeah. I'm actually really high on Daryl too. Um, you know, and I guess at some point you and I need to kind of put our heads together and come up with a 2021 Ohio rankings list. But, um, you know, when I was with rivals, Daryl was, whenever I was asked about Daryl, I was always referred to him as a fringe top 10 guy in the state. Um, so no doubt, no doubt. He, he's a guy I like quite yep. a bit. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think if we had went through spring football and maybe had seen some more attrition, maybe we'd have a better idea of if Ohio state could squeeze a guy like that in, because I don't think it's insane to look at their defensive line class and say, okay, even if they get JT and Taiwan Malone, why couldn't Peterson squeak in as like an edge guy as part of like a six man D line class because of what they've been losing on the D line here these, this, this last couple of years. Um, especially if they lose a couple guys early to the NFL draft after this upcoming season. I mean, what, you know, what if, what if Tyreek Smith has a great year or something like that? But um, I, I agree with you though, in that, in, in the way it looks right now, it does look like they'd have to lose somebody, either a committed guy or or lose out on on JT, I guess, because I don't Daryl and Taiwan Malone wouldn't wouldn't really impact each other. Um, so that's probably true. That's probably how that would have to work out. But um, I'd be intrigued, even uh, even if everything went well, if they get JT, if they get uh, Taiwan Malone, if they've got if they keep Tanmise in the class. 
I would still be interested to at least explore the idea of Daryl Peterson as an edge guy. Um, but you know, again, that, that may not, that may not line up with what, what Ohio state's thought process is. So that's, that's kind of me uh, going off, uh, going rogue there a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he's interesting to me. Um, you know, I'll, I'll stay on defense here. Um, I think Aiden Hubbard out of St. Ignatius. Yep. Yeah. would be worth yep. watching. Yeah. And here's, here's why I still think if they fell in love with another linebacker in, in 2021, that they would find a spot for one. I don't think there's anything that makes a lot of sense right now. Obviously, if they could flip Rajon Davis, they would do that. Obviously, if they could flip Barrett Carter, they would do that. Um, Carter, to me, is a pipe dream, and Davis, to me, is, you know, not a pipe dream, but also not likely at this point. Um, so that would open the door for Hubbard. Um, and, and I think the other thing is, they have a log jam at linebacker right now. And, and I have to wonder, I mean, maybe it'll be, it should be fine this for this upcoming season, but I do have to wonder, doesn't someone have to transfer at some point at that position? <laughs> like on the, on the, am I, am I crazy? Doesn't someone in that, you know, top seven or eight have to grad transfer after the season or whatever it might be. Doesn't someone have to leave? Um, well, that, well L, that, that clock is ticking for that Mitchell right. Pope. Dallas Gantt group there that clock is ticking, right and it's ticking quickly I wouldn't be surprised to see one of them red shirt this year you've got the, the COVID factor you've got a messed up season I could see one of those guys red shirting just to clear some guys out of the way and, and try right. to develop a little further I don't know I mean I agree with you there's a log jam there and then to get back to Aiden I mean Aiden is Pete Warner in my opinion that's who he is as a player He's 6'4", he's 220, he's played safety so he can play in space. He's smart, he's tough, he's aggressive. He's got a lot of Kyle Berger in him, and we used to love Kyle back in the day, coming from a great program. I mean, Aiden Hubbard, to me, is a borderline four-star. And, you know, and I'm not here to criticize anybody's rankings. We haven't seen Aiden since last fall, so I could be dead wrong. But to me, Aiden Hubbard, is everything you want in the modern linebacker, you know, where we're, we don't see the Chris Spielman guy making 20 tackles anymore in between the guards. Those days are gone. Aiden is versatile enough, you know, that, and he's very similar to Dallas Gantt too in, in skill, but I guess Pete Warner would be my best comparison. So I love the kid. I mean, I, I definitely see him, you know, as a, you know, Northwestern's perfect for him in a lot of ways, but he would listen to Ohio State. Yeah, I just, you know, and again, I'm looking at this from the Ohio State angle of, you know, obviously they're, they're not going to look for another running back. They're not going to be looking for a quick, but, but linebacker is one where I think if a kid puts some, put some stuff together on, on film here this senior season that they just really couldn't ignore, I think they would move on a linebacker, whether that's an Ohio kid or whether that's a kid from California or whatever, it could be anywhere. But I'm just saying, I think in general that there's a, there's a part of them that would like to add a linebacker to this class if they can fall in love with one. So there's an opportunity there, I think. And then you take that. And then in addition to that, there is a bit of a log jam among the upperclassmen now. And you do wonder like if someone would transfer or whatever it might be, if that may, you know, up the urgency level to get another linebacker in this class. So I think there is an opportunity there, Um, but okay, we'll move on. Uh, I know you got another guy you want to talk about here. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, we've, we've talked about him a lot on the message board and stuff. And and that's Terrence Rankle at Masklin. And um, you know, right now he's a guy that's probably pretty criminally underrated in the uh, composite and no knock on anyone. Nobody's seen these guys, you know, I know Terrence, and, I, and I've seen the growth physically. You know, he's gone from a, a 6'4", 210-pound kid to a 6'6", 285-pound kid real quickly, but it hasn't affected his quickness. You know, he was a tight end not too long ago, and a pretty good one. Um, so when you, you get that athleticism with a kid that's at, that's long, I mean, he, he's the guy that I would look at. Now, would I consider him a project? Yes. You know, he would fit with 
you know, four of those guys they took last year, he's right there with those guys with probably more upside. Um, would I take him over JC Latham? Nope. Would I take him over Tristan Lee? Nope. No way. But, you know, if those guys go somewhere else and you got to look down your list a little bit, I think Terrence is perfect. Good kid, hard worker, developed his body, quick feet, length. I mean, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to take a risk on a lineman, I, I like that. The six, the six guy that's an athlete, I think would be on my high on my list. Yeah. And I'm not going to beat the dead horse here too much. Cause we've both talked about him a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm also in agreement in terms of I, I really like him as a as a long term guy, um, but you know, again, looking at this from the Ohio State angle, I'm it's it's getting harder and harder for me to believe that if they truly are going to take four offensive linemen in this class, that they aren't going to have to take at least one Ohio kid at this point, uh, one more Ohio like one late bloomer type Ohio kid at this point. Um, it it just, you know, could they pull it off with Tristan Lee? Maybe. Could they pull it off with Jagger Burton? I'd probably I'd probably give them better chances of that at this point. Um, that's also a maybe. But I don't think they lead for either one. And if again, if you're looking at two more and your two or three prime guys aren't leaning toward you, that tells me you're gonna have to take an Ohio kid at some point here. Um, you know, obviously they do have Ben Crispin, but you're gonna have to take an additional one here at some point, which opens it wide open for Terrence Rankle. Right, um, right. And that, that'll that kind of uh, put me into my next guy, actually, which is uh, Thomas Remack out of Brunswick, yep. who's also an offensive tackle. Um, right. This is another guy I really like. I think size, athleticism is all there. I think he's a tackle. Um, he's very, very quiet. I, you know – at first, you know, going back maybe six to eight months, I had to confirm he existed because I had people up that way kind of telling me about him. Well, I've never talked to the kid. I've never, you know, <laughs> and uh, we confirmed his existence. Um, so he, he quietly committed to West Virginia this summer. Um, that's another guy I think Ohio State was, was definitely keeping an eye on. And I think that's another guy who will be on the priority list for them in terms of early season film, making sure they do their diligence there. Um, so I, that that's my answer to Rankle. I think one of those two, you know, shoot, I, I think there's, I think there's a better chance than not that they actually offer one of those two guys in the next four months. I, if you had, if you put a gun to my head and said an offer to at least one of those two guys in the next four months, yes or no, I think I would say yes. What about you? I mean, how do you feel about that? Do you do you think it's you know do you think it's the other direction where it's probably not or kind of where do you where do you think that would sit? No, I've kind of got rankle in my projected classes right now because I would be less optimistic than either you or Alex would be on the Jagger Burton, Tristan Lee, J.C. Latham possibilities that I have all of them. Well, Jagger Burton, I think they have a shot, but he's a guard. Um, the Latham and Tristan Lee, I think it's a huge uphill battle. So I, I ha actually have Terrence Rankle in my projected classes right now. I think the odds are very good that he gets in. And even if you do get one of those guys, you still need another one. So, right. you know, the relationship at Maslin is so good. They really have a great relationship with Nate Moore there. Uh, Terrence works out with Thera Mumford, and Thera is pushing for that offer right now. You know, Jaden Ballard's in the class. I mean – there's a lot to like there with that Mouseland to Ohio state connection right now. So yeah, I've got Terrence Rankle is highly probable to be in the class. Yeah. Um, you know, the one guy we, we talked about before we started recording that I think we both really like, and we even like as a potential Ohio state guy, but probably did not get the news he would, would have wanted if he wanted the Ohio state offer is is sticking at Maslin here is Andrew Wilson Lamp. I think he's very intriguing as a defensive back prospect, um, and even maybe even a wide receiver if if they would miss on Abuka. But I'm not convinced he's in a good spot right now based on what we've seen the last several weeks with uh, Denzel Burke and Jordan Hancock then flipping. Um, I think the door is probably pretty much shut at defensive back unless they lose a guy, um, unless someone decommits. I think um, that's probably not been a very good couple months for Andrew Wilson Lamp's offer chances. 
Um, and at receiver, if you look at him as a receiver, I'm not convinced if they miss on Abuka that they're even going to really worry too much about replacing um, that. I mean, they, they, could just, they could just roll with what they have given all the young receivers they have. So I don't know if you disagree with that or kind of where you stand on that, but I don't think the last two months have been good news for Andrew Wilson-Lamp on the Ohio State offer front. No, I don't either. And, and I think Ohio State does they, – they do see him as a corner, not as a wideout. Um, Jordan Hancock coming in probably wipes him right off the map. And, you know, Burke probably got the spot that, that maybe they were considering Andrew for. And then if they would have lost Devontae and not gotten Jordan, then, you know, you're scrambling to pick up a dude. The one thing I would say for Andrew is, you know, he is committed to West Virginia. I'm not sure how solid – but that commitment is Penn State's banging hard right now. He, Andrew really got hurt by not having, number one, the spring evaluation phase because Maslin holds a pro day. And I've been to that and last year stood there and talked, you know, there's 50 college coaches that show up at their pro day, including Ohio State. Talked to Brian Hartline there last year, talked to Ryan Day there two years ago. So it's a big deal, the Maslin pro day. And Andrew could have really shined there and then got in Ohio State's attention, his plan was to come to camp then where he could have worked, you know, for six hours with Kerry Combs, put him through every drill you want to put the kid through. And, you know, that – but they haven't seen him, you know. Um, we saw him in person, you and I, um, against, Matt, against McKinley last year, and we loved the way he played at corner. That was like the second or third time he'd been on the field as a corner. He doesn't even know the position. So – he would be a guy that I would say is in that Mitchell Evans boat that maybe at the end of the, the process here, you got one spot available. And with Andrew, it's like, Hey, bring him in. Maybe he's a corner. Maybe he's a wide out or, you know, the same way you look at Mitchell Evans that, Hey, maybe mm-hmm. he's a tight end. Maybe he's a tackle. You know, the versatility that these guys have could end up getting him that, that last spot in the class. Yeah, and and just one thing I want to be clear on, at least from my end, is I like Andrew Wilson-Lamp probably better than some of the guys I brought up as potential options for Ohio State. It For me, it's, it's just simply a matter of the way the dominoes have fallen and what Ohio State's needs are and, and what they have and, and the roster setup and everything else. You know, um, as a pure prospect – for me, he's, he is uh, one of the better guys that we've talked about. It's just, it just doesn't look like it's going to be the right year. If that makes sense. Um, It just doesn't look like the dominoes have fallen the right way for him, but that doesn't mean I would actually have him below some of the guys we've talked about. I actually have him above many of the guys we talked about as a, as a, in a vacuum as a prospect. So it just, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. There's going to have to be some attrition there or something, um, something strange I think is probably going to have to happen at this point, but he's definitely a guy to, to I guess, to just, you know, you keep watching, keep watching the film and, uh, and kind of go from there. Um, all right. So we've kind of, you know, there's some other names, Bill, you know, you can check out on BuckeyeScoop.com. There, it's, it's a longer list than even what Bill and I just discussed. He's got several other guys on there to watch. So, um, you know, if you're curious about that type of stuff, whether it's just the general landscape of Ohio high school football recruiting or, or just, you know, for Ohio State purposes, for some guys to watch for uh, this fall, um, go ahead and check that out. Um, we're going to kind of wrap this up with, with one question. Uh, Bill and I will each kind of touch on this. Um, you know, they, they just locked up cornerback, I think, with, with Jordan Hancock. I think, you know, again, unless there's some attrition there, I think they're probably done there. Um, you know, down to probably maybe five or six spots ish. Um, you know, what is, what is the one, you know, what is the one thing they have to have between now and, you know, I guess December or February, however, this is going to work this year with who knows how that's going to work this year. But, um, you know, between now and when the dust settles on this class, you know, what is the one thing, if, if they can only address one thing, what, what would you, what would you point to Bill? Well, I mean, anybody that knows me at all and has read anything I've said, my answer is the same every year. You know, I can go back to when they took Tommy Brown and Chris Carter and Underwood. You know, it, it's O-line for me every year. And maybe that is just me overrating the position. But I think here we are again. 
You know, you start out with a bunch of names that are NFL future players, and then you start whittling them down. And, you know, I think we're at that position now again. I mean, I think they need, they need one more dude in this class, at least. When it looked like they were going to get four, you know, you got two that I really, really like a lot. But you need at least one out of Latham, Lee, and Jagger Burton to have your three solid guys. And then go ahead and get Rankle or Remack or Rodriguez or Mitchell Evans. But, you know, to be sitting with two offensive linemen right now, it's not where they thought they would be right now. And like I said, say if they keep the two guys they have and then have to go two projects it's not good enough so I'm always going to harp on O-line I harped on it when it was Ballman and I harped on it when it was Warner and I harp on it was Stud but I've never seen a championship team that has a subpar or average O-line I just don't think it's possible and I've seen teams win with subpar quarterbacks we've seen that we've seen it at Ohio State by the way so the position group is that special to me. So you're going to get the same answer from me until the day you guys either fire me or I retire. It's <laughs> always going to be, it's always going to be O line for me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I basically agree with that, but just for the purposes of, uh, you know, some discussion here, I, <laughs> you know, the, the, the one, the one thing, you know, I look at right now is, okay, what are the two, the two things you know, really the most important thing right now and, and really at all levels of the sport, including the NFL, is to win a championship, you have to have an explosive offense. You, you, you just have to. And so with that said, the second most important thing to an explosive offense is disrupting an explosive offense. And how is the best way to disrupt an explosive offense? Well, that's to get a pass rush. So No doubt. No I, doubt. Will, I will go with, you know, landing JT to Maloa. And that will be my um, that will be my guy uh, as far as what they need to do there um, because I think they've got a phenomenal interior pass rusher in Michael Hall. I think they've got arguably the best player in the country in Jack Sawyer, but certainly one of the, one of the top few players in the country. And I think that's a you know as we we've jokingly called him the you know the third Bosa brother. Um, if you could put JT on the opposite end of that, and this is no disrespect to some of the other guys they've recruited, and this is no disrespect to a guy like um, Tanisi, who I think is a good player in his own right as kind of a hybrid um, interior, um, possibly interior pass rusher, possibly, you know, strong side end. Um, but if you put, if you put JT and Jack on, on opposite ends, um, that's a real problem. I mean, that is, that's having Nick Bosa and Chase Young all over again, in my opinion. Um, that's, that's having two just monsters and that's the best way to combat, you know, the Oklahoma's and the Clemson's and and of the world and the the explosiveness those teams have on offense. And when you get in those championship games and, you know, the games aren't going to be 14 to 10 anymore, they're going to, you know, it's going to be who can get that stop, who can create that turnover. Um, that to me is is right up there with offensive line right now is getting that one other guy because they have been turning over a lot of defensive line in the last couple of years to the NFL and um, it's harder you know it's harder to keep the talent levels up when you're losing guys in three years when you're getting a lot of three and duns you know you got to keep you got to keep the your foot on the gas or you know you you lose a couple of three and done guys to the NFL and, and that it leaves a void so um, I think um, you know I I think they got some good players in, in last year's recruiting class but I don't think they got that slam dunk three and done bosa young type of guy um in that class or even like a zach harrison um in that class and so to get perhaps two of them in in this year's class would be a huge game changer and would really help the transition they're about to go through um as some of these older guys move on here the next year or two so that's kind of uh that's up there for me right there but yeah games are won and lost in the trenches there's no question um all right, I think we've uh, I think we've about hit the the range we wanted to go here. Um, again, I'm I'm super hopeful that next week's podcast will have some type of insight on Ohio high school football this fall. Hopefully, it's hopefully it's me and Bill uh, reporting on some things we've seen in the next week uh, from getting out there and, and watching some practices and things like that. Hopefully, 
Um, but um, in the meantime, you can you know check out all of our stuff on BuckeyeScoop.com. We appreciate everyone uh, reading the site and uh, the feedback uh, we, we continue to get on things has been amazing here these first two months. So we appreciate everyone kind of sticking with us. And, uh, we'll, we'll see you next week.